Oh. <laughs> I'm getting laughed at. You're being recorded, so you're okay. I'm being recorded, okay. <laughs> so what should we say? Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon Bible class, even though the surroundings look a little different. We are still continuing. We are ready to pick up in Revelation 21, verse 1. We are ready to go on a great adventure, are we not? I wish I could say we were there. We are there, but we're not there. We're there the same way, almost the same way John was there. Yohana. What am I saying? We're not in this timing yet. We're looking forward to it, but uh, it is such a blessing to study it. I give you all kudos who have stayed with me through a long haul called the Tribulation. <laughs> then we even had to get through the Great White Throne Judgment. We had to get through the casting into hell. All very important, but I love the way God always brings us back into the blessings, brings us back into the heavenlies, brings us back into the up, and we get to just revel in it today, and that is what is so exciting. We stopped on uh, talking about heaven. Last class, we talked about how the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is referred to in scripture. We looked at the fact that we saw that there are different levels in heaven, that we have the first heaven, which is the atmosphere around us, the earth, the firmament, firmament. <laughs> Genesis, Bereshit, chapter 1 and verse 8, and verse 20, where the birds fly. Then we saw we have the second heaven, which is the sun, the moon, the stars. We see that in Genesis 1, again, in the beginning, a very good place to start. Go to verses 14 to 18, go to Genesis 15, 5, especially because that's where God takes Abram out, shows him the stars, and from the Hebrew says, narrate it. Tell it if you can. We saw Psalm 19, 1 and 2, or 119, 1 and 2. Which one is it? I think it's 119, 1 and 2. Um, talks about the heavens declaring the glory of God. We know Yeshua Jesus is the glory of God from Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3. So the heavens are declaring Yeshua Jesus. And uh, Psalm, it might be 19 also. Anyway, whichever one is right, verse 2 talks about how the day and the night have speech. How do they have speech? They're also declaring. They're telling the story. They're part of it. And we went into the meaning of that, and sometime we may take that deep study in the gospel in the stars. But for right now, we're going to move on. We're going to go past that second heaven, and we get to hit the third heaven. The third heaven is often called God's heaven because it is the place that Paul referred to as paradise. He said he was in the third heaven, and he was caught up in the paradise. We talked about how paradise used to be in the heart of the earth after the resurrection of Messiah Yeshua Jesus. It was taken into heaven, and that's why with the, when um, the thief died on the cross at the same time as Yeshua Jesus, he said, today you'd be with me in paradise. And yet in the book um, of Matthew, he had also said that the Son of Man would be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. So we know that Yeshua went into the paradise side of Sheol, in the heart of the earth, after his death. But we see that, that something happened between then and when Sheol Paul says, I was caught up into God's heaven, into paradise, and he was in the heavens, where we also see Yohanan is caught up and gives us the view that we have in Revelation, especially chapter 5, we saw that, you know, initially starts even in 4. So we know that the paradise side was taken from the heart of the earth, and it was put up into heaven after Yeshua's blood was put on the mercy seat in heaven so that the way it could be open for us to come in. We saw that from the book of Ephesians chapter 4 in particular that gave us this movement of uh, Sheol, uh, of the uh, paradise. But now we know that we are talking about the eternal home. We know that we're talking about our eternal home. Uh, usually it's referred to from Yohanan, John chapter 14, uh, verses 1 through 3 in particular. We'll go ahead and start there today. We'll, we'll be right back in uh, Revelation, trust me. But uh, this is important to see also. And John 14, Yohanan, John 14. And I love verse 1. Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Well, who's speaking? Yeshua Jesus. When you are told by those who are involved in a cult that Jesus never claimed to be God, read them that verse. <laughs> That's only one verse and a very easy one to remember, a very easy one to understand. 
Do you believe in God? Do you believe in Him? That means they're one and the same. He's claiming to be God. Because we do not ever get told that we can worship more than one God. Our worship is to God and God alone, who manifests Himself in three personages, Father, Son, and Ruach HaKodesh, Holy Spirit. In my Father's house, where Jehovah is, Yeshua on earth, talking, are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I will receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. These are beautiful verses that encourage us that the Lord is preparing a home for us in his presence, where he's going to come get us, and we're going to get to be with him forever. That is exciting. Now follow that thought. Take it to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews, as I'm always telling you, is a very good Jewish book. I think there's no argument with that. It was written to the Hebrews by a Hebrew. <laughs> of course, uh, I won't tell you that's true about almost every single book in the Bible. <laughs> but in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 16, I want us to read about that city that Yeshua was telling his Talmudim and others about in Yochanan. And we read in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 16 that as it is, they desire a better country. They're looking for a country that is a heavenly one. You may have they're looking for a better city. Okay, They're looking for a better location apart from what's here on this earth. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God because he has prepared a city for them. So the believers in God are looking for a place that is to be their eternal home. They looked for a city whose builder and maker was God, is how it's referred to it in another translation, um, or in another verse, one or the other. I'm not seeing it right here. But anyway, you get the idea. There is a better place. It is a place built by God. That's key. Built by God. Keep that in mind when we go into class today. I can hardly wait. <laughs> okay. Um, well, let's look at, let's go to chapter 12. Let's we'll just go one more, chapter 12. Oops. Okay, go back. I'm in the right book. I just need the, the next chapter. This is where you have the advantage with the tablet. You have to call up all the numbers again. Chapter 12, verses 22 and 23. And we read it there. But you have come to Mount Zion, Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. Now, as soon as it gives you that definition after it, you know we're not talking about the earthly Mount Zion, Mount Zion in Yerushalayim. Remember how often we have the real in heaven, the imitation or the, count, the counter, the, the patterned after on earth. So there is a Mount Zion that is in heaven because it says that it is the city of the living God. And the next phrase removes all doubt, the heavenly Jerusalem. So we're not talking about Mount Zion on the earthly Jerusalem. We're talking about Mount Zion in heaven, the heavenly Jerusalem. And up there in that city is a myriad of angels to the general assembly, the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. Who's that? Could that be us? Are we on the rolls? Do we know from our last study our name is in the book of life forever? So is this looking forward to that time when we're part of the general assembly, part of the church, part of the angels who have our enrollment in heaven and to God, the judge of all? to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Wow, what a verse or two verses do we have here. How exciting. You want to be in the presence of God? You want to be in the presence of the angels? You want to see a holy Jerusalem, the holy Mount Zion? Well, I'm not going to tell you to buckle your seatbelts. Because <laughs> you don't even need to do that. <laughs> okay, this is what we have to look forward to. Now let's get back to Revelation 21. And I'm going to give you a sneak preview because you all know me. I love to read the end and then go back. <laughs> I, I do that often and I don't consider it cheating. I consider it wise. When you know the destination, the journey takes a lot more purpose and specificness given to it, if that's a word, if I can use that word. You can be very specific in your way to go when you know where you're headed. Very important to know where you're headed. 
So Revelation 21, we're going to look at verses 1 and 2, and then we're going to drop down at 10, then we're going to come back up and take it apart, like we always do, or unpack it, as David Jeremiah says, I like that, unpack it. <laughs> then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first, first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. Again, we'll come back and talk about that. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, I remember this. We were talking to, uh, about this by Shaul Paul before. So everybody who's reading Yochanan now with that good Jewish mind says, I remember, okay, I get it. So here's the holy city, the new, the, called the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Keys, tells us where it is, tells us from whom it is, and that it is made ready as a bride adorned herself for her husband. We just talked about someone getting married in September. Is she starting to make plans? Is she picking out her dress? And is she deciding how she's going to do her hair? And is she getting her entourage all signed up and ready to? I think it's a lot of fun in that planning. But we get this idea. This one is a bride who already is adorned. She's ready now. Go down to verse 10. Like I say, we'll come back and talk in detail. But go down to verse 10. And we have, and this is Yochanan narrating for us as he has been all along. And remember, he's not telling us thoughts. He's not sitting there thinking, hmm, I think I'll write a story. You know, I used to give my third graders take their spelling words and put them into a story. And I tell them, be as creative, be as wild as you can. And I love the day when one of the kids used the word zipper and said, how come my dog's fur coat doesn't come with a zipper? So when he's too hot, he can zip it off. Or when it gets dirty, we can throw it in the washing machine and then put it back on and zip it back up. <laughs> That's the imagination I want you to have today. Be third grade. Take the lid off and let God show you his habit. Now, I got news for you. No matter how good you do that, it's still going to fall short. But we're all going to try to go on this great adventure and really see what God has prepared for us because he gives quite a description. And if it doesn't excite you, then check and make sure you are a citizen of this location. <laughs> so again, in verse 10, we see that we're going to see the New Jerusalem coming down and out of heaven from God. So that tells you where it is. When I ask you later, if I remember to, where is it? You're going to have the answer. That we have a description that follows. The dimensions are amazing. The description is a dazzling display. That's why when somebody said they liked our background for today, oh, it doesn't compare, doesn't hold a candle to what the Lord's going to paint, the picture he's going to give us. So let's get started. Let's go on this road of discovery to the sights, to the sounds, to the, the style, everything that we can glean because guess what? This is our eternal home. Are you excited? If you got excited when you moved into your home here, you know what it was like to go in the first time? You know what it was like to begin to, to put it together and make it the way you wanted it? Great. But how about for eternity? And then know that somebody's made it for you. You don't have to do the work. And you know what? He's made your place with you in mind. So what he's made for you is different than what he's made for me. I know what mine's covered with. <laughs> <laughs> you got it, Don't I got it. There will be rainbows all over mine. <laughs> and I do not give the rainbow to those who want to take and warp what is God's. The rainbow was God's gift, that's what he called it in Bereshit, in Genesis, that he said, I have gifted my bow. So I'm not giving it over to the others, I'm not giving it up. I love the picture that it is and what it means in my life, and yes, it's all over heaven. It's around the throne, and it goes far beyond the throne. There are so many, so dazzling, so amazing. I had a little glimpse in my eye that nothing in this earth has ever measured up, and I have a sneaking suspicion even that doesn't measure up. So that's what I'm saying. Let's go. Let's see what we can find out. Let's go back to verse 1, and let's enjoy. This is a happy class. I love this. After we've come through the tribulation, come through hell, Thank God we haven't gone that way, <laughs> but we need this. So, right off from the start, and remember, just because we have new ones in here today, is Yochanan John, who is speaking to us. God gave John a vision. He was caught up in the spirit, and he saw as if it actually had already happened. So it would be like you 
this is a sad comparison, but like you sitting down watching a movie and then it unfolded and then it happened. Why I say that sad is a TV, a movie can't compare. But we know Yochanan's mind was absolutely blown with what he saw. How do you take a first century person who's never even seen a car and introduce him to aircraft? <laughs> you know, how do you take one who, who doesn't know any kind of, of uh, technology, the computer, all of that, and how does he describe the mark, etc., that we easily understand because of today? So he did an outstanding job, in my opinion, but now he's got this task. Now he's got to try to describe what he saw and happened for us. And I think he did a great job again, but how much more? So, Yochanan said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Remember we read in the last chapter, the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Remember when they stood at the great white throne judgment, they were standing out in space. They were not in God's heaven because they are sinners, and sin can never be brought into God's heaven. So they're not in God's heaven. They're not standing on the earth. They are literally standing in space. That's nothing for God. Even our astronauts are managing to have a space station and to stand out in space, but not the way God's going to do it. He's not going to have them tethered and worry about one block. Oh, so escaping. But escaping, yes, no, not one will escape. But uh, we know that they stood in space at, I'll say, a space platform, God's platform at His throne, went through the judgment, and we know now heaven and earth have passed away. And remember, in that heaven that passed away is our stars. That gave us our story that was narrated to bring us to this time. Because in that gospel of the stars, it went all the way through to the return, to the millennium, and to this point. I have a sneaking suspicion that had to go away because it's all done now. When you read in the, the uh, synagogues, you read the scriptures, in the scrolls that they have, they continually are rolling that scroll. When they get to the end, it's all rolled up, is it not? Now, of course, because of the way that we do it here on earth, they start over again. But what I see is God's rolled up the scroll of heaven. Those stars that all fell at the end, his mighty hand working, because remember he threw out those stars by finger work, named them all for his purpose. That purpose is done. I think that's why it's all rolled away now. It's all gone, and we're going to get a whole new, I don't know, do we get a road map? Do we get new stars? Well, hang on. Keep the minds going. The wheel's turning. Let's see what feedback you want to give me, but let's see what we get from Scripture. What it says in Scripture, we'll say, this is it. What it doesn't, we'll, okay, could be, couldn't be. But here's what we do know. It is a new heaven and a new earth. That means it is not this heaven and this earth. What it stresses from the Hebrew also, which I'll take you very quickly to Yeshaya, Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 17. Isaiah, Yeshaya chapter 65 and verse 17. And we read, For look, only give it to me, where's Tony? No. <laughs> Eric beat at you. Eric took your glory, Tony. <laughs> You'll have to be ready later. <laughs> Behold! <laughs> yeah, remember in the book of Revelation, 30 times we hear, Behold! And every time we do, we know it's God saying, Wake up, pay attention, sit up, take notice, don't miss this, it's important. Well, we carry that thought anywhere we read it in Scripture. So here, Behold! Hello! Pay attention. In fact, the... Uh, um, yeah, 65 and verse 17. Isaiah 65 and verse 17. Now he says what he wants them to know, what he wants them to pay attention to. I create a new heavens and a new earth. Past things will not be remembered. They will no more come to mind. And it goes on. i got to stop where I'm supposed to stop. <laughs> okay? Now, the Hebrew, the word here for new, I create new heavens, that word is the same word that we read about in Genesis, Bereshit, Genesis 1-1, when God created the heavens and the earth, okay? It is a new heaven. We know it's not God's heaven because verse 2 of Revelation 21 tells us that God's heaven still exists because the new Jerusalem comes out of God's heaven. 
So we know God's heaven is still there. This is a new heaven. It is not God's heaven. Okay? Some think that if God's presence and they're ahead of us, they know where his presence is going to dwell eternally, which is in the new city, in the new Jerusalem. And we'll see that in Revelation 22 and verse 3. We'll also see it at the end of 21 in verses 22 and 23. So they think, well, then there's no need for heaven where God's dwelling now. But God's not the only that dwells in the heaven now. Remember my description all earlier? We've got a myriad of angels. We've got a general assembly. We've got all kinds of people. We have Old Testament saints that have to be living somewhere because they're alive. You know, so, um, so God's heaven, even if his presence is going to be in the new Jerusalem, it's still God's heaven, and it's still going to be there. So this Hebrew word indicates a fresh new thing. God's doing a fresh new thing. Now, that word is also given to us with the word new in Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Let's go there and see what's new there. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 and 32 is all we'll look at this time. I have to not get excited and go past because I love 31 to 37. <laughs> but I will stop and read Okay, Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah 31, and verse 31. Okay, I'm in my complete Jewish Bible. I want to give it the Jewish flavor. Yeah. It's got another behold. Yeah. Behold. <laughs> the days are coming, says Adonai, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Okay, I'll read verse 32. Also, it will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day I took them by their hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. Why? Because they, for their part, violated my covenant, even though I, for my part, was a husband to them. Interesting terminology in light of what we're studying today. So we have a new covenant. Now, does anyone here think that new covenant wasn't something new? Good. <laughs> we know it was. The Old Covenant was law. The New Covenant is what we call grace. We know it's through the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus. He makes that very clear in many, many locations. So we have something that's a fresh new thing. It's a fresh new idea. Lest I take you just to the original scriptures and to the Jewish version, let me take you to, well, except again, it's in the book of Hebrews, but still, it's in what you call the new, and I see at least Eric's mind is running ahead, and I love it. Hebrews, and this time I'm going to take you to chapter 8, and several of the verses in chapter 8. We'll start with verse 6. Hebrews 8, 6 says, but now the work Yeshua has been given to do is far superior to theirs, just as the covenant he mediates is better. For this covenant has been given as Torah on the basis of better promises. Okay, the Torah, the Old Testament scriptures, Torah in particular, Genesis through Deuteronomy, Bereshit through Davarim, is where we have the containment of the law. Okay, so he's saying that there's the first covenant, the law, but this is a new covenant, and this one is mediated on better promises. What's the key word for the book of Hebrews? Better. 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 Very good. Everything in it is better. Here's your better covenant, a new covenant. When I take that into the Strong's, which gives us the back breakdown of the words, the background, when you go to the etymology of a word, you go into this word and you see that it can mean um, it's a new shape, it's a new creation, a new form. It's fashioned by cutting out or shaping out, and every time it's used in scripture, it's always used in connection with the divine. In other words, it's divine activity. He's the one carving it out. He's the one shaping it. He's the one cutting it. Uh, there's something new that's getting his attention, so to speak, that he's working on. So again, from the Greek and from the Hebrew, we get both times that it's something new, something fresh, something unused. So this is something that is totally different. Now, as I spoke just recently about the gospel and the stars, here's a thought also. Would we want for all of eternity, and who knows how long that is, I mean, there's no limit on eternity, would we want to be constantly reminded of Satan and sin and how it tainted all the heartache, no. I see all the heads shaking. No. No. None of us will want to. I think that's a part. We'll never forget what Messiah did for us. 
We will always see the nail prints in the hands and in the feet. We will always know the high cost of our salvation and our eternal home with him. But I think he allows the forgetfulness God. of the sin, of the curse of the consequences that that caused that brought such grief to us even on this level. And we can only imagine when we're in the holiness of God how much more. And I agree with you, Rosa. And that's Thank why God. I love when you read Isaiah 65, 17. Because I don't want to remember. Right. The right. things that I have done. Our guilt and our remorse will be no longer. Exactly. Exactly. And I love the fact that when we stand before him, it's not a bringing out of all of our sins. Our, our sins aren't hung out on the laundry line. But, you know, for all those who reject, it is. <laughs> I learned that from Israel. I guess that's a very Jewish thing. I'm excited. It, just, it, just what that verse said uh, just really spoke to me just now. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And hang on, because there's more coming. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love the excitement. Okay, let me give you a little contrast to talk about a little bit why I'm stressing a new earth and what we're going to see. Go with me to 2 Peter, 2 Kepha, not far ahead of Revelation, 2 Peter. And we are going to go to chapter 3. We're going to start with verse 10 in chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 10 and verse 3. Starts off telling us that the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Now, if I've taught you well, what's the day of the Lord? Judgment. And it starts with tribulation and it goes through millennium. So we've come all the way, and it really goes right up to where we are now. Our new, our new eternity, we don't know. It'll have a new title, whatever, but we know that it cuts right up against that. Okay, so we know the time that's being talked about. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. Remember, it comes as a thief to those who it doesn't belong to, those who aren't a part of it. We're never caught like a thief, you know, catching us off guard. We're children of the day, not of the night. A thief comes to rob, still and destroy at night. Okay? But that thief, that tribulation period, that all that came to rob them because they were not in right relationship to the Lord is part of the time that's talked about in which the heavens will pass away. Okay, that's what we're talking about, right? The heavens are going to pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Okay, we've got some heavy things here. I think I told you before, but I'll go back into some of this again. Um, okay, I had intense heat. Someone in their version had melt, probably King James Version. Do you have that it will melt? Anybody have King James? I do. What, 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 read you? verse 10, please. Or oh, it might be an 11. Keep the reading. one who deserves life. Is no. Life. No. no, no, no. Second Peter. No. Second no. Peter. Second Peter. Three. Ten. 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 And those words in it will be first Okay, there you go. Did you hear read that they would melt? Okay, in the King James Version. Okay? In Peter's first book. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, that happens. Okay, melt and dissolve from the King James, no matter whether that's your translation or not, but that, I think, paints a little better picture for us. The word in the Greek comes from the root word luo. Luo means to loose the thing which has been compacted or built together. Now, if you remember when I told you before, we talked about the atom. The atom is compacted, built together. It has the neurons and the um, neutrons and the electrons and what's the third one? Protons. Thank you, boy. I need my basic science lesson. <laughs> okay. And it, it would be like that all coming apart, all loosening, all coming apart. It dissolves into something else, into parts that are not cohesive. They're, they're incoherent, shall I say, um, easily. What we could be reading here is the, the earth is made up of atoms. We know that. And it could be a letting go of that. We know God is keeping everything in the way that it is. God is so orderly that he has put into the, the pathway of the heavens such that we know when a, um, 
Okay. Meteor, is it meteor? Yes. yes. Took place and when it will take place again, even like Haley's comet. Comet's the word I want. Yeah. We have we, we can know when a comet was. We can know when a comet's coming. We can measure time by the heavens to know that even have they say there's time missing. And that time just happens to coordinate with the timing in scripture where the sun stood still. One other time also. So there's almost a missing day. And scientists will admit to that and yet they won't they say they have no answer. Well, that's because they don't want to believe the word of God. <laughs> yes. But we know this is God in complete control. He's the one that put gravity into motion. We talked about that last week, I think, where if you're at the equator, do you feel like you're standing out sideways? What if you're in Australia? <laughs> Are you going to be standing on, you know, on, on your head, so to speak? Is the blood going to rush to your head because you're upside down? <laughs> and Edith's not going to feel like she's standing upside down. And she's not going to think we are or we're not going to feel that way. And I will also give you the, the great question that kids can ask you. If they ask you, where's heaven? And you say, up. Okay, then where, where's heaven tonight? Now where's heaven five hours from now? And where's heaven tomorrow? <laughs> We know we're moving, so we know that, that God has orchestrated in such a way that is phenomenal, beyond our imaginations. We've studied it and learned to put names on it and understand to a degree, but we know we can't even measure those heavens. Jeremiah 31 told us, if you can measure the heavens, God can make a full end of Israel. Well, guess what? Every time they tell you, oh, we know where heaven ends, give them just a little bit of time on what happens. Oh, there's something else out there. And I just laugh. Because God said, you'll never measure it, okay? So, he's the one that easily is holding it all together. He's the one that put it out there. He's the one that flung it into space and put it into motion. Easily, all he does is stop it. It falls apart. It's not held together by itself. It's held together by our God. And when our God wants to change it, our God will change it. When we read that the heavens and the earth will pass away, they will pass away. Did Yeshua talk like that? We see that we're talking about God saying it, with God doing it. Of course, if you know, if you've been with me long enough, you know from Bereshit, Genesis 1, 1, in the very beginning, you have both God the Father and God the Son in creation. I love it. By the time you get to verse 2, you have the whole tri triunity. You have the Spirit moving on the face of the earth also. All three were in action in what we call the creation of our world for us today. So if you've been with me long enough, you know that I'm talking about either or. I'm really talking about both. But let's see. What did Yeshua say? Remember, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a thing be established. Well, when Yeshua says it, that's enough for me right there. Go with me to Matthew, Matthew chapter 5. And let's see what he told our, and I keep harping on it, but I want you to see and understand it from the Jewish perspective. What's he telling our Jewish boys? Okay. The Talmudim were Jewish. They study the Jewish scriptures. We know that those same Jewish scriptures that were being studied told us that the earth was not where you go and fall off, that it had a sphere. We know, for those of us who have studied in history, Christopher Columbus's mappers were Jewish. In their mapping out, they encouraged him to go, set sail. There were those, oh, no, 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 you're going to go so far up. Goodbye. Christopher. <laughs> well, hello, America. <laughs> thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Jewish mappers. Thank you, Word of God. Yeshaya, especially when that opens you up scientifically. But even Nahum tells us that the clouds are the dust of his feet. Guess what scientists tell you clouds are made up of? Dust. So when you see a lot of clouds, is the Lord walking around our area? <laughs> Matthew, chapter 5, verse 17. Do not think I came to abolish the law of the prophets. Yeshua, Jesus speaking. I didn't come to do away with the law. I didn't come to do away with the prophets. And remember the prophets spoke of him. He came to fulfill, not to do away. And that's the next phrase. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, verse 18, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away. Now, did he say, if heaven and earth passes away? Until. Until, until heaven and earth pass away, the smallest letter or stroke shall uh, shall not pass. Okay, the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from law until it's all accomplished. I'm reading horribly today, but the point being, until heaven and earth has, have passed away, the law is not going to be done away with. Every part of it. 
you can cross the I's and dot the T's in our English. Okay, but you notice he said it will pass away. Okay, go to chapter 24. We've been in 24 a lot. I think you all should be good authorities in chapter 24. By now we're going to jump into verse 35. And in verse 35, and we know in 24 we're talking about tribulation period. We know that it lays out. It goes into uh, what follows after, into the millennium. In verse 35, what do we have said? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Okay? Are heaven and earth going to pass away? Yes. Yes. Word of God's going to stand forever. Amen. Heaven and earth will pass yes. away. Okay, so we, we see it is very clear. Let me give you just one more authority. Let me take you to Mark. Okay, chapter 13 of the book of Mark. And we will see that he also refers to this in chapter 13, verse 31. There we go. Mark 13, 31. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Okay, we've said it once. We've said it twice. We've said it three times. Done. <laughs> I think that, that our point is proven. Now, notice the time that is going to happen. I've got to take you back in your mind to Revelation 21. And it said there that at the end of the day of the Lord, or at the, the time of the day of the Lord, how does the, let me take us back. You're going to go back to first, Second Peter, sorry. You're going to go back to Second Peter 3. So stick a finger in there as you go back to Revelation 21. And in verse 1, it says, okay, for the first earth passed away. What did I want? No, I wanted the timing. Okay, where did it have the day of the Lord? It told us that. Second Peter, I. Okay, go to Second Peter, everybody. Sorry, folks, my mind's spinning. Second Peter 3, yes. We were in Second Peter 3.10. We're going to look at other verses around there also now. But go back to Second Peter 3.10. That gave us the timing because Matthew told us heaven and earth will pass away by the word of the Lord. Mark told us by Mark's word, which is far less authority, but still, he's confirming what was said. We know in Revelation 21, it tells us, well, 20 tells us about the passing away, 21 tells us about the new. Now let's back up and get the timing, because this tells us when it will happen. Verse 10 again, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar. So the heavens are going to pass away in relation to the day of the Lord. Now when we go into the very end time of the tribulation, we have the heavens falling, we have the stars falling, we have the signs that are in the heavens, and as we continue on, we know that changed it from how it was, but it finally fled, flees, <laughs> it finally flees at the great white throne judgment that we saw at the end of chapter 20. That that's when it makes it very clear. Heaven's gone, earth's gone, and they're standing out in space for that judgment. So we know our timing. We know that this is going to happen. We've looked at the fact that in 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12, we saw, I think, yes, we read it there, the intense heat, the melting, and all of that. Now, take a little peek back up a little earlier in verse 6 of 2 Peter 3. That says, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. Okay? Or if you have King James, it's going to tell you the word per the world perished. Okay? Perish. That would give us somewhat of the same idea. But that is where I'm telling you in the Greek and in the Hebrew, in the background, is different. The word that gives us that word perish gives the idea of something that's not totally consumed and it gives the intent that there's misery there. Well, would that fit for the flood during Noah's yes. day? Absolutely. We know the earth suffered the consequences of mankind's sin. It was put under water. We know much of it was destroyed. It hurt. It hurt. There's misery there. Mankind suffered greatly. Loss of life was great. So we see a difference between these two. But you notice that in 6, it's not talking about a new. Yeah. When we use that word new, remember it's a different word, and it's connected with Isaiah's new, fresh, something unused, something totally different, something completely new. The word in Greek, by the way, is kainos, K-A-I-N-O-S, kind of looks like kainos is the word in, uh, in the Greek. And again, when you take that in the Strong's for the breakdown of the word, and you take the, the Hebrew word, which I forgot to write down, and I don't have it in front of my mind right now, and the, yeah, I didn't write it down, I'll get it for you next time. 
both of them will say, new, fresh, unused, a new thing, something being created, a form taking shape. So, with all that in mind, and by the way, it's Revelation 20 and verse 11 that talks about uh, the other being passed away. As we go back to Revelation 21, go ahead and, and just stop off in 20, and then we'll go right on into 21, but I want you to see it in its context. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. I think that's pretty clear, and I even get the idea when God's setting up to judge, whoa. And that whoa, even heaven and earth fled. They were even gone. They couldn't stand in that judgment either. That's the idea I get from it. Uh, the Greek is this idea, departed or go away. Okay, so now in chapter 21, with all of that behind us, in chapter 21, back into verse 1, we have the first uh, heaven and earth passed away. And there is no longer any sea. Okay, now, everybody who loves the sea hates this verse and thinks, oh, no. <laughs> but, but wait a minute. Let me tell you what the sea is a picture of. And I don't think you'll have any mind, any problem letting go of this. Because remember what we saw about this, the waters when we looked at the time of judgment here just real recently? What's being kept under the waters, under the sea, so to speak? Yeah. Those demons that are so bad that God's not even allowing them to have a time to be loose on the face of this earth. And the ones that are here on the face of this earth, that's bad enough, folks. I wouldn't want anything any worse. So when it says in Jude 6 that he's kept them confined, he's kept them in prison, kept them in chains, kept them under the deep, kept them in the dark, all these are our scriptural references. We get the idea that it's a holding place, just like Shoal has that compartment of suffering there is a place possibly even the abyss because we know that that one comes up out of the abyss comes up and that was the antichrist we know that that satan is put into the abyss in my chart remember it showed it under the earth okay all of that may be all under the sea and in the water and if the sea is the holding place the prison so to speak for the demons and for the fallen angels that would be why there's no sea found in the new heavens and the new earth because there is no demons anywhere in God's eternal creation. The new heavens and the new earth. Thank God. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's say it all. Yes. Yeah. Get clap for the Lord. Fine. I'm with you. With the sea taking up over 75% of our land mass, now you have room for a large population. Remember during the millennium, they're reproducing. Okay? We never hear that that stops. We never read of a time when everyone is put into the form that we are when we put on our immortality. I said it right. <laughs> we, we don't read of that for these earthly people. So they probably are going to go on populating the new heaven and the new earth, or the new earth, I should say. It probably will be their home and it will be being populated. Now, I will take you to theory. Hear me clearly, okay? When I can be dogmatic, I am. When I cannot, I tell you, theory. It's not my theory, but I like this theory. We have a solar system that's humongous. We have other planets in that solar system. We are part of the Milky Way. We're a dot in the Milky Way, we know that. Then the Milky Way is in Let's just call it another Milky Way. That's in another Milky Way. And we go on and on, do we not? Yeah. You know, any any scientist in the room want to say it better, say it better for me. Galaxies. 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 Okay. We know that. Now, here's the theory. This new Earth is created. It is a size because it's a, it's, it's a planet, a bulb, whatever you want to call it. And people are living on it. And they are reproducing. And, of course, what are they doing? What God had intended with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They're fellowshipping with God. They're praising God. They're walking and talking with God that he will be in their presence. We're going to see where the new Jerusalem is in light of that, but hold on to that thought. Sooner or later, that earth is going to fill up, right? I mean, population explosion, right? There's no death. Nobody's dying off. So if you start with 100, 
and 100, even just had two each, you've got 300. Now you've got 300 that are quickly going to multiply. It doesn't take being a rocket scientist. The earth's going to get full. What if God takes a people from that earth, and he takes them and he puts them on another planet and lets them continue on, grow, multiply, and what are they doing? Praising God, worshiping God, walking and talking, having a relationship with God. This planet fills up. So God takes them from this planet and he puts them on another planet and go on and on and on. And what do you eventually see? The heavens singing the worship to our Creator. The heavens worshiping. The heavens declaring the glory of God. Is it not a beautiful picture? Don't you like that? Can you come up with something better? Okay, come tell me. I'll share it. <laughs> but I like that thought. So, go back to Earth, though, the new Earth, and the fact that there is no sea. That does not mean there's no water. Okay? We have the river that flows from the throne. We're going to see that. You can take a sneak peek into chapter 22, and we will see it there. We'll talk about it in detail there. But it's not that it's void of water. It just means, and it, I think it calls it a river in, in chapter 22, but it means that what we're calling the sea, we're calling the area that's confining and holding the abyss of demonology. Who would want that? That's what's done away with. Okay, and those of you who think, oh, well, I've got to have the ocean. I've got to be able to see. Well, hello, you have no clue. I have not seen nor ever heard what God has prepared for those who love him. I have a feeling your sea and your love for the sea, and I speak to my dear Pastor Gil, who I love, <laughs> is nothing. It's going to pale in comparison. We're still trying to understand heaven on earth in terms. And we want to hold on to something. I think of a little child that was born into a humble home that just wants to hold on to that home. Oh, I love my home. This is precious to me. And you're saying, but here, I want to move you into the palace. Oh, no, I don't want the palace. I want my little, you know, rickety, it, it shakes every time the wind blows. And, <laughs> and we're saying, in love, no, come up here. Get a taste of this. So that little one gets to go to the palace for the day. <laughs> now, you want to go back and live in your hovel? <laughs> so whatever you think that you can't do without, God's got a surprise for you. That's all I can say. Just wait and see, and then argue it with God if you've got a problem. <laughs> okay? So we have a first earth, first earth, a we've got the new earth, with no C now. Again, I think to show us that, that what it stands for is gone. Okay, now we're looking at the new city because we have verse 2. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned herself for her husband. So the new Jerusalem is the home of the bride, right? Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's find out a little bit about this new home. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Don't you love our topic for today? Yes. I'm just reveling in this. <laughs> I've had enough of the yuck. <laughs> in chapter 11, we have Shaul Paul, and he's talking to the people who lived in Corinth. That's why it's called the Corinthians, because we're called San Bernardinoans. We're called Americans. We live in America. We live in San Bernardino. Well, they lived in Corinth. And Shaul Paul's talking to a specific group. He planted a church there. That little church had a lot of problems. He's got to give them a lot of correction, a lot of instruction, and, but at this point he is telling those people that had come to believe that were in the nucleus that he formed this little group, he says, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I, for I betrothed you to one husband so that to Messiah or to Christ I may present you as a pure virgin. Remember betrothal in scripture was as good as marriage? So Shaul Paul saying, I, I give birth to you, you're my baby, but you are what's called the church. And the church is looked at as betrothed to the Messiah. You belong to the Lord. So you need to act accordingly. 
I want to present you as a chaste virgin. I don't want to present you as a harlot. I don't want you going after other gods or other adultery or after it's sin. I want you pure. I want you holy. I want you living the way you should for a bride who's adorning herself for her husband. And in this case, the husband happens to be Christ. Keeping that in mind, we also go back and look at Revelation 21, where we're, we are today. I should always keep a finger there because we are, we are there. <laughs> Revelation 21. For all those scoffers who laughed at me and said we'd never get there. <laughs> Verse 9. <laughs> then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, we'll talk about who that is when we get down to that point, but right now just, just take it that you know who he is. He's exactly who he sounds like. It's who we saw at the time of the seven bowls. Full of the last seven plagues that came, spoke with me saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Now, who is he talking to? Who is the angel talking to? John. John. Very good. To Yochanan. He's telling Yochanan, come here, I'm going to show you. Remember, Yochanan is getting to see as if it's actually happened. Happening, happened, completed. He's not imagining. He's not being given thoughts. He's got a, a, a show going on before him. So the angel, come on, come over here, John. Let me show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Okay? Verse 10. And he, the angel, carried me, Yochanan, away. How? In the spirit. Yochanan's the Hebrew, John's the English. If I'm confusing you, I'm sorry. I try to get both so that you, you get both flavors. So he carried, he, the angel carried me, John, away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem. again, the description, coming down out of heaven from God. So we know the new Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, is in heaven, where God is, and it's coming down out from heaven when we are seeing this. But notice how he saw it. He didn't see it on earth in his humanness. He saw it when he was up, seeing the vision, taken to a high mountain in the spirit. And he's being shown this in the spirit, okay? Now, the church, which we just referred to, let me give you a little background from the same author, from Shaul Paul. Let's go to Ephesians, and let's see what he means by that, uh, what we just read about being a bride adorned for her husband, belonging to, um, belonging to her groom. Ephesians 5 and verse 27. Now, in Ephesians 5, you get great direction for how wives should treat the husbands, husbands should treat the wives, etc. And oh, by the way, both are told to submit to the other. So those who lord it over others need to read the scripture, Amen. read it in depth and see it. God has a beautiful balance there. And who is the head? He is. You put the Lord as the head. If the husband treats his wife the way the Lord treated the church, the Lord gave his life for the church. You show me any woman who has any problems submitting to a man who is willing to lay his life down for his wife. And then when you also see that he's told, the husband is told to submit to the wife. He belongs to the wife. He's to protect her. He's to be her head. He's to be an example of the Lord. Beautiful picture. God took an earthly relationship and showed us in it something that we can understand now a little better on the heavenly terms. Because notice, husbands and wives are given the, the beginning of this, but when we start in verse 27, we're reading that he, excuse me, the Lord might present to himself the church in all her glory, having not spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. How on earth is the church going to be presented holy and blameless? Remember we just saw in Corinth that they were to act like a chaste virgin. Were they acting like that? No. no. Do you know how bad it was in Corinth? Yes. We had sons with their moms doing things that shouldn't be done. We had all kinds of problems going on. But here we're being told that the Lord is presenting, he might present to himself the church in all her glory. How is that? He's clothing us with his righteousness. Very good. Washing us and he's clothing us with his righteousness in his blood, in his shed blood. Remember when we're seen in heaven coming back with him, we are clothed in our robes of righteousness. He does it all. 
We just oh, simply really open up to him and he does it all. But that's how he presents us without uh, spot or wrinkle. In fact, um, verse 26, so he might sanctify our having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. <laughs> the word, we know what the word is. And the washing of water, water we know is a purifier. When you see it in scripture, out of the, the, the belly will flow living waters. Every time we read about the waters, it's in relation to the Lord himself. He being the living water, really for us, satiating us. So here's the, the idea behind it where we see it developing. Uh, tells us again in verse 28 how the husbands ought to love their wives and because no one ever hates his own flesh and nourishes it and to do it as Messiah does for the church. Uh, the, the two are supposed to cleave together, be joined as one flesh in verse 31. Then verse 32, the mystery is great. This, this is something new. Hmm, what are we being told here? He makes it very clear. I'm speaking with reference to Messiah and the church. Okay? Has been a wife relationship. Now we're seeing as the husband and the church. Again, our bridegroom is the Messiah. Our bride is the church. Okay? The body called out the assembly, the, those who are believers in Yeshua Jesus. Because they didn't use that word church. They called it an ecclesia. In the Greek, a called out assembly. But what we're talking about is believers in the faith. Those who have been washed by the blood, washed by the water, wearing the robes of righteousness, that's who he's referring to. So we see very clearly that's who he's talking about. <clears throat> now, we already saw that heaven is also the home for Old Testament saints. Remember we saw that in Hebrews 11. In fact, let's go back there because there's a couple other verses. We'll look at it again. And I don't know about you, but repetitive helps me. Yes. learn and hold on and you know I retain more the second time the third time is still good sometimes I need a fourth fifth and sixth so Hebrews 11 we'll start with verse 9 yeah I don't think we even read 9 earlier we read a little later but we're going to back up 8 tells us that we're talking about Abraham Abraham he was uh, obedient he went out when he was called he went out didn't even know where he was going Abraham go where Go. <laughs> no, that's not how it went. Avram, go. Okay, he went. You don't say no to the Lord, and don't even bother to ask where. If he tells you to step out, go. Okay, he went out to the place that he was to receive for an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, Abraham lived as an alien in the land of promise. Remember, he came into the land we call the land of Israel. But it was as an alien. What does an alien mean? Foreigner, good. It's not his home. It's not where he belongs. God brought him into the promised land, but God didn't say, this is all I'm bringing you to, Abraham. This is your home. This is your place. This is all that, that you're getting. This is what I'm giving to you. No, he didn't say that. He said that he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Yitzhak and Yaakov, Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. Okay, God's promised something to Abraham. He's promised it to Isaac. He's promised it to Jacob. Now, we know they were also promised the Holy Land. We know that. I'm not taking away from that. But the promises went beyond that. Remember the same way Abraham looked at those stars and saw all the way to the shed blood of Messiah and believed in that coming day, and that's what was accounted for faith? Because having a big family never saved anybody. <laughs> it is true that was also promised the same way. They were promised the land, but they were given a greater promise, a, a promise of a land. Hmm. I wonder what could be greater than the land of Israel. <laughs> you won't hear much follow that sentence except this out of my mouth because I love that land. He was looking, verse 10, for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Okay? Not something made with earthly hands, not something on earth, not something earthly. This is something obviously heavenly, otherworldly, out of this world. This is created by God. This is, he's the architect and he's the builder. Well, hello, do you like this earth? You think he did a pretty good job? Do you like the heavens? 
Do you like the stars? Have you gone to the Hubble telescope and looked at the colors and the designs and the creativity? Have you seen the aurora borealis, the colors and the amazing? Have you seen God's creation of the flowers, of the animal kingdom, of the fish in the sea? What floats your boat? We all have different tastes and different likes and it's all gorgeous. But I'm being told there's something even greater. That's what we're looking at. This is the architect and the builder is God. He created this, but he's created something even better. Because what we're seeing, that we're enjoying, that we're loving, is all tainted by sin. It's all under the curse. God tells us all of creation is mourning, it's moaning, excuse me, it's moaning, it's groaning. Because it's under that curse also. It's looking to be released too. I believe that everything was alive and living and speaking in a way we don't understand. But we get little glimpses. Because we have the Lord say even the rocks would cry out if we didn't talk. Then we have Balaam's donkey. When that donkey needed to talk, it talked. We have the serpent in the garden. And he didn't say, well, how's a snake talking? <laughs> We know the curse changed a lot. What has God built for us? We've yet to see. Well, let's find out what we can about the New Jerusalem. Let's see how much we can understand. So let's go back. Um, oh, and by the way, uh, before we go back, go to chapter 12. Because I've said it. I'm not sure if we read it here or we read it somewhere else. But chapter 12, 22 tells us that this is also for the angels. 22 and 23. Oh, we have. We have read it. Yeah, come to Mount Zion. The heavenly, to the myriad of angels, yes, so you know it's the angel song too. Okay, so we go back to Revelation 21. I never promised you that we'd get through the whole chapter, did I? <laughs> no, we never do. Okay. That's because God says too much. That's right. <laughs> no, not too much, but he says a lot. That's because we're there. And we want to learn it all, don't we? We want it in its depth. Okay, so back in verse 2, we've got the, that this is the home for the church, the called out assembly, the ecclesia, whatever word you like. We see also, we have talked about being the home of Old Testament saints. And for the angels, we are talking now, let's look at the phrase coming down out of heaven. Let's take that apart. In the Greek, we have coming down out of heaven from God in that order. Now, the idea that we're given there, because it's coming down out of heaven from God, it doesn't say that it comes down and sits on earth. So that's our first clue. We've got something that probably is in the heavens. Remember, we've got new heavens. We've got a whole new system here you know, that we're trying to begin to discover. So probably it does not come down and touch earth because it doesn't say that it does. We'll have a little more about this also. But we also notice something else. We know new heavens and a new earth were made. And this is called the new Yerushalayim. But look at where it comes from. It comes out of heaven. That means it's existing in heaven. Mm -hmm. I believe the new Jerusalem is there today. I believe those who are in heaven have seen it. And I'm jealous. <laughs> but I believe that it had a previous existence. It does not speak like it's being created. Instead, it speaks like it's being moved. And again, it talks in the Greek as it being in heaven, coming out of heaven. Remember how I tell you every little preposition in Greek is important? And today, I remember to bring my little box. I have my little mouse. Remember our prepositions in the Greek are anything that the mouse can do in relation to the box. So in this case, it was in the box. Okay, now if I make this heaven, and I'm coming down and out of heaven. Okay, so I think we're pretty clear that, that this is not anything new. It did exist. It existed in heaven. Does that make heaven a little bit bigger than you were thinking before? Because this wasn't all the heaven. This is in heaven. Wait till I give you the dimensions. If it's not making heaven bigger to you, get ready. Because your mind is too little. Okay, get those third grade brains out and <laughs> create with me. Okay, and how is it coming out of heaven made ready as a bride adorned for her husband? At this point, I'm going to just say the freshness and the beauty of a bride. Tell me, has anyone ever seen an ugly bride? <laughs> They're always beautiful, aren't they? 
Okay, we're going to talk more about that as we go on, but we all have the idea of what it is like. So let's just go ahead and look at verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Oh! I love it. You are great students. Behold! The tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them. They shall be his people, and God himself will dwell among them. Or will be among them. Right there. <laughs> and I heard it now, Lord, now. <laughs> I'm with you. But that verse, we could camp here the entire time. Because this is the whole crux of it all. This is going to take us all the way back and it's going to catapult us all the way future. Let me explain how. First, we've got a loud voice. This is a subsequent revelation. This is a new revelation. This is something that's coming out. I think that's why it's loud. It's important and it's authoritative. When you need to speak something new to a group of people, you get loud, don't you? When I want attention, attention, behold, hello, that's what I think it's saying. This is authoritative, this is one that's stepping up with authority saying, hello, this is how it is. Now, we've heard that authoritative voice 21 times in the book of Revelation. We're only in chapter 21. The average is about that it doesn't come out that way. Those of you who like to play with numbers, I bring this out for that reason and that reason only. Don't read too much in the numbers, but also God is in the mathematics and the sciences and everything else too. So you can look at the fact that you can take 21 and you can take 3, the number for God, seven, times the by 7. God's complete and perfect number and you have his completed and perfect picture here in this verse. God and his perfection. And that's what I believe we are seeing because... What is this doing? And this is the part that I love the most. I pray to God, give me words, Lord, to get this across because there's so much in this. Tabernacle of God. Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. God dwells with men. Do you know that's what tabernacling means? The tabernacling is the dwelling with. Yes, there was the tabernacle. That's where the word comes from. Remember what the tabernacle did? The tabernacle was the place where God's holiness came down and dwelt with man. Now, I just had the privilege of going through um, Hebrews 12.1, running the race, the cloud of witnesses, yeah. mm -hmm. from a Jewish perspective. And I took and looked at the words according to how the Jewish people would look at these words. That cloud... Oh my goodness, and I'm still digesting all this. Yeah. That cloud that came down on Mount Sinai, we know the cloud is the Shekinah glory of God. We know it's God. But it talks about how the cloud came down, and Moses, Moshe, was in that cloud. Seven days. For six of them, we don't know what happened. On the seventh, God gave, God spoke and gave the law. But the idea we get from the Hebrew, when you break down, go into the etymology of the words, is that there was an intimacy between Moshe and God. Six days, all Moshe did was dwell, tabernacle, in the presence of God. And I don't know about you, but when I read that, not only do I still have the chills, but I'm, my heart is, oh God, take me up and give me six days. I want this with you. I want this with you now, as much as I can have it now. And I just, I just want to stay there. And that's where I, I'd like to, us to camp and just stay, just there. Let the Shekinah glory come down in this class. Let us just sit. Do you know how you can just sit at the feet of your loved one? You don't have to speak. They don't have to speak. You're just so content to be in their presence. And you don't want them to leave for a moment. Because even that is a horrible void and an emptiness. But here, it never leaves. We have this forever. But do you know every time we see it talk about clouds in relation to the Lord, we see it in this we see it in his coming in rapture in the clouds. We see him coming in the second coming. And we see in his ascension, the clouds also. So that when 
would they look at it from the Jewish mind and now this would have to be a completed Jew who's willing to look into the new covenant that gives us these times. They have nicknamed the Lord the cloud man. Oh. And I love that. And he's that cloud that spurs us on in that race. Yes, we have the witnesses, the testimony from chapter 11 that's gone on just before us. And oh, by the way, I think that's the Jewish Hall of Fame because it just happens to be Daniel. <laughs> Who I can't even think right now, but all the ones that are listed there. Why? Because that's what our scriptures are telling us. The story of Israel. God in relation to Israel, people in relation to Israel, the nations in relation to Israel. Why? Because God chose, I will make you a priest to the nations. Because I will put my name here, and they'll come up and be blessed. So it's just the point that he chose. This is how he chose it. And he wanted, from the very beginning, to tabernacle with man. He wanted a tabernacle with Adam and with Eve. We read that he walked and he talked with them. We know at that time he wasn't with them 24-7. It wasn't the way it was with Moshe when he, when he was in the cloud and they're with them. But we know God was constantly in that. But I can take you back in the Hebrew to the creation of that man and show you in those words how God was already wanting to be in relation with his creation who is a part of him because remember he breathed in and Adam became a living soul and then he gave him the Shabbat the Sabbath he gave it to him we read for a rest but remember in the beginning Adam didn't have to fight the earth he didn't have to take out thistles and thorns and weeds and he didn't have to work by the sweat of his brow so why is he needing to rest it's not a rest of, I'm tired, any more than God was tired when he rested on the seventh day after the creation we read about. But in that rest is that picture I just gave you of Moshe in the cloud, that intimate relationship. Just sit and dwell here. Just let your mind focus on me. Do you hear him? Do you feel him? Am I taking you up in the cloud? Yes. Is the cloud coming down and sitting? And if it feels this good here now, oh, I can't wait, Lord. <laughs> Take us home now. <laughs> Get it on. This, yes, go ahead. It does speak to my heart because I've been babysitting to my, my grandson. It's for my soul. Yeah, now I won't say baby sitting, I would say cloud sitting. Because you know, when he's with me, I can tell he's at peace. When he, he's moved away from me, even for a moment when he's sleeping, he senses you. I think God is in our relationship and it's like that. Yes. Yes, and I want to be so sensitive that if I start to move away from his presence, I want to feel it and run right back. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to get away at all. But when you see, that was God's original intent. All the way back from, if you want to call it day one, all the way back, his intent was to make man and then have that intimate relationship, that tabernacling together. That's why when he came, when, he, when God took on a face, slipped into time and space, put on a face, we call him Yeshua Jesus. And that's why it says in Yochanan, John 1, 14, that he tabernacled with man. Look at John 1, real quick. I'm off, but hey, I love this. We're here for it all, right? We're not here to be narrow-minded, we're here for it all. Yochanan chapter 1 and verse 1. John, in the beginning, hmm, I think I heard those words in Bereshit in Genesis, Lord. Are you telling us something? Well, we can even precede that beginning because we don't even understand this beginning. We don't understand eternity past any more than we do eternity future. But in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we know who we're talking about. We've got our two, our, our God the Father and God the Son, and we're already in trouble trying to separate them, aren't we? Because in the beginning was the Word. 
But the word was God. <laughs> you can't tear him apart. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. I'll take you, when we get to Genesis, which I think is on her, our horizon, I'll take you to how the Lord Jesus, Yeshua, created. Oh, but wait a minute. It says God created. Right. <laughs> I'll take you to God creating. I'll take you to Yeshua creating. I'll show you from the Hebrew how both are It's fascinating. All things came into being through him. Apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life. And life was the light of men. Now, remember that phrase because we're not going to get there today. But when we get into this description of the New Jerusalem, light is huge. Remember, the light was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. That's now. The darkness can't comprehend it. Now go down. Well, verse 6 tells us, I came a man sent from God. And that's Yochanan to witness these things. So he wasn't the light, but he was the witness of the light. Now verse 14. The word... Remember we had the word in verse 1? The word was with God and the word was God. Verse 14, and the word became flesh. And in the Hebrew says, tabernacled among us. And we saw his glory. What did Moshe see? His glory. In that Shekhinah cloud, it was, it was, um, it, it wasn't stark. He didn't blind it is what I'm trying to say. And we know the time when he asked, God, I want to see you. And God said, man can't. He, he just absolutely cannot see and survive. Human cannot contain that glory. But he found a way to give Moshe a glimpse. And he passed by, and then he let Moshe see what remained behind. And the way I describe it, that I, I learned from someone, if you have a light bulb, you don't put a shade on it. You've got just the light bulb, the light's on and you turn off the light, there's that afterglow that's still there. That's like what he saw. It wasn't the real, but it was what's left behind. And even in that, you're going to do it, I think, I don't think these will work. Look at the light. Oh, okay, try it. Look at the light. Look at the light. Yeah, not much of a glow, a tiny bit. Light bulb does better than the fluorescent. Yeah, <laughs> Go home and try it with a light bulb. Believe me, but watch that you don't blind yourself. You have to discern it. Yes, same idea. Same idea. And we're going to talk about the sun in relation to this also if we get there. I, I don't know. I Probably not today, but we're getting there. It's the Old and New Testament up there, and it's so great because it's true. They were of the new beginning, then the new commandments. And then regarding resting, you have the Holy Spirit, and you need to be reminded. And then he says, rest and abide in him. And they're sitting on the phone, they're sitting. Both of them are resting, they're sitting. Yes, they're not pacing, they're no, not, there's they're not no standing. concern. Nope. No, they're, they're done. done. Yes. yes, and remember it's like a love seat. Yeah, Go for two. there you are. Yes, okay, good point, good point. So again, in, in, in Yochanan, in John, uh, verse 14 here, we have the tabernacle, we have the dwelling, and that this was what God had wanted from the very start, and here we're finally seeing it. He came in the form of human mankind so that we could one day go home and be in his heaven and dwell as the way he intended, tabernacling with him. Is that not beautiful? All of that out of our little phrase here that tells us that uh, of the tabernacle I'm looking for it. I gotta go back to Revelation 21. My memory's too short. <laughs> Revelation 21. So. <laughs> Shorter than I'd like there. Behold the tabernacle of God is among men and he will dwell with them. Okay? So um, let me see if I gave you everything I wanted. I told you that was his purpose from the Garden of Eden. Then we see it in the tabernacle, we see it in the temple, we see it in Messiah himself. We see it even in the called out assembly, the church today, that relationship that we feel. How could we feel what we just did if we were not tabernacling with him? Anyone who does not have him within would not have felt a thing that we were talking about. You can't fake that. That comes deep, 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 deep within. We know that. And, um, another way to put Yohanan John 1.14, the dwelling in the tabernacling, is that he pitched his tent. I like that because Yeshua came, but when you pitch a tent, it's temporary. He didn't come to stay and be here forever on earth in that human form. 
He came for a purpose, and we know that he did ascend back in the clouds, and he will come again in the clouds. Right. How exciting. But we see he tabernacled continually. He shows it to us, and he again, and I'll take you to the verses now, tells us who it's for. Go with me real quickly to Isaiah again. Yeshia chapter 66 and verse 22. Almost the end of Isaiah. Oops, I'm wrong. Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66 and verse 22. For just as the new heavens and the new earth which I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so your offspring and your name will endure. Now, Isaiah's got a Jewish audience. He's talking to Israel. He is at the time when Israel's going to go off into um, captivity by Assyria. It's about, it's the 8th century, 700, early, early 700s during this time period. But God's assuring, even though this is what the future is going to be, he's assuring. Just as the new heavens and new earth, which I make, will endure, your offspring, your name, will endure. And then he tells what it'll be like during the millennium, where you have your new moon to the new moon, the Sabbath to the Sabbath. But notice, all mankind will come down before to bow before me. All mankind. I get the idea, this is for peoples. This isn't just for Israel. This isn't excluding Israel. But it's for peoples. Peoples. Nations. Does that fit? Let's go back to Revelation 21 and see. Go with me to Revelation 21, and we get one of those sneak peeks. We're going to go to verse 24. I know we're not there yet, but we're going to get that little cheat sheet out. We're going to get a little, hit a little peek. And it tells us that the nations will walk by its light. Now, it is the New Jerusalem. We'll talk about the light. We'll get that in between. But the nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Well, if you've got nations and you've got kings, now you definitely have more than an Israel, don't you? You've got other nations. It's plural. You've got kings. It's plural. We know there's Messiah sitting on the throne in Yerushalayim during the millennium. We know Israel's the head nation then. It sounds to me like God does not do away with the nations and with the peoples, that he has a great plan for them and is including them. And we do know Israel is included forevermore. There are nations that he has made a full end of, that he said he would, that come up against Israel. We know they are gone forever, or they will be gone forever if they're in some of the future ones. But look with me at Hezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 37, and let's see what he tells Israel, because we see the nations here. What about our little Israel? Ezekiel 37. Yes. 21 and then 26 to 28. Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 21. Say to them, thus says the Lord God. Okay, we know who's speaking, and what's the first word out of his mouth? Behold! I think it's important. I will take the sons of Israel from among the nations where they have gone, and I will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. Okay, now, we know today, time has progressed from Ezekiel's day. Where do you find Israel today, the sons of Israel? Scattered. Scattered. Everywhere, don't you? You find them in the Philippines. <laughs> you find them in New York. <laughs> you find them in Mexico. You find them ever in San Bernardino, of all places. <laughs> okay. So, verse 21, they have been scattered where they've gone. God's going to gather them and bring them into their own land. Now, we know in proportion to the scriptures here, we know chapter 37 is talking about when Israel's back in her land as a nation born in a day. We know that was true in 1948. We know it is prior to... Armageddon, chapters 38 39, prior to the millennium, chapters 40 through 48. So we know that line. So here we see it's talking in line with that time, that there'll be Israel who will go into the millennium, basically, is what I'm saying there. But read with me now down here, verses 26 through 28. I will make a covenant of peace, of shalom, with them, with Israel, forever. Whoops, I skipped the line. Sorry. It, well, it does come. It says it in a different way here. I will make a covenant of, of shalom, of peace with them. It will be an 
everlasting covenant with them. When does everlasting end? Never. 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 Okay. I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. What's the sanctuary of God? Heaven. Where he's dwelling. The tabernacle. Could it be that the new Jerusalem is his sanctuary? And he's setting it in the midst forever? I think this goes far beyond now. <coughs> The Ezekiel 37 telling what's coming in the tribulation and the millennium. I think we're looking now to the future. My dwelling place also will be with them. And we know God's not coming down to earth to dwell on earth to live in San Bernardino, California. <laughs> or even Jerusalem, comma, Israel. I will be their God. They will be my people. Hallelujah. And the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. Has that happened? No. No. Israel's not ready. Is she in right relationship with her God for his sanctuary to be in her midst and her to honor it, be his, her, his people and, and God, God be their God and they be his people? No. No. But we know that's the future coming. And we see then it's not just for a millennium, is it? Because that's not what's said here. It's forever. And even in the millennium, even with the Lord dwelling on earth, on the throne, he's also dwelling on the throne in heaven. How? <laughs> he's God. No problem. He can be two places at once. He can do it. He can be in a multitude of places at once. So we know there's something different in the millennium from what's being said here. That this sanctuary in their midst forever. Remember, Israel goes on forever. Other nations do too, because it says there are other nations forever. When you use that word forever, you are now catapulted to eternity forever. What a beautiful, beautiful promise. God will be their God. They will be his people forever. Do you know Israel's history? Bless her heart. I love her. I'm talking about my people, okay? But the track record isn't good. She's right with her God. She's worshiping her God. She's pleasing her God. She's being obedient to her God. He's blessing her and in her flourishing. She forgets her God. And she goes all the way off into exile to be brought back into remembrance of her God. And we don't see it once. We don't see it twice. I can't count on one hand how many times, even in the period called the Judges, a period of 600 years, it cycled over and over and over and over. And we see it continue even to where she is today. I love that land. Trust me. I love it. It's my home. I love it. But when I go there, I'm not rejoicing as a believer in the presence of my Lord, seeing the Lord being worshipped and honored and glorified. No. Israel is very European and has the standards of Europe and they're not our standards, they're not God's standards and they're not what, what we want to see. It grieves my heart. I pray for my homeland. The same way, have to say it, America, you're no better. You also know who your God is or should know and are not walking in line with his, with his commandments and being obedient today. So I'm not taking her out and just saying, hey, Israel's bad. No, mankind has the problem, and we know that. But there is this coming day, this day that is promised forever. Forever. And when God says forever, it is forever. It never ends. If it ends, our salvation ends, people, because our salvation is forever. And I have no fears, no worries, no condemnation when you are in Yeshua Messiah. Go back with me to Revelation 21, and let's see what is in store for us. We're having an exciting time of learning. It's going on forever and ever and ever. But what's it like? Are we going to be happy there? <laughs> How about an understatement? <laughs> because look at verse 4. Verse 4 says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. 
Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, God. That's what we get forever. Because we know the opposite right now. Now, let me tell you first, the emphasis from the original language is that he shall wipe out every tear out of their eyes. What does that mean? The emphasis is on God's comfort, not the emphasis on the suffering, the pain, the death. And all that. The emphasis is on God, and he wipes out everything that puts the tear in the eye. That's how he wipes the tears out of the eyes. No longer any death. Do you know what today is for me? Three years ago today, my mom graduated to heaven. Oh. And when I got to teach this in what was originally her Bible class, mm. I said, oh God, <laughs> you bless me beyond my wildest dreams. Mm. To be able to stand in her footsteps. If you like what you're hearing today, she poured into me. She taught, trained me. She brought me up. And not my mom alone, but because this is her day. <laughs> and I say her graduation day. But I can go back three years. And I wasn't in such a happy place as dwelling on the glories of heaven. It wasn't a surprise. It wasn't anything like that. God met me so beautifully in that day that I could even rejoice in that day. I don't want you to think I could. But when I read here, no longer any death. I have a dear friend. <laughs> Are we blowing the shofar? <laughs> I have a dear friend down in Palm Desert who probably by the time class is over I'll have the message that her mom's now in heaven too. And I'm walking through these days with her. Why? Because God comforted me. Not that I could be comfortable, but that I could comfort someone else. But you know what? When we get to this point, there's no need for that either. It's gone. It's gone. I think if I went around the room, every single one of you probably has been touched by death. And be gone. And be gone forever. Many of you may be sitting on that precipice hoping you don't face that loss of that loved one, that the rapture be it. But if it doesn't, just know. God will comfort you through it. I stand here, testimony to the truth. And yet, I also point you to that grand and glorious day coming. No more death. Death came because of sin. It's going to be gone. Isaiah 25 and verse 8. If you don't want to go, I'll read it for you quickly. I think I'll get there quickly. Isaiah 25 and verse 8. He will swallow up death for all time. The Lord God will wipe tears away from all faces and will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. Oh, I love that verse. Does that just take Revelation 21.4 and put it on steroids? <laughs> I love it. Death will be gone. Gone for all time. God's wiped away those tears from the, our faces. He's wiped away what causes those tears. It is gone. No more reproach. We are His people. He is our God and we have it for Ever. Are you getting excited? Are you finding it hard to stay here? I am. <laughs> I just, I just, exactly, exactly, exactly. And that's why also when I loaned you my mom's book today too. Her testimony lives on. Thy people shall be my people. She lived out the book of Ruth. We've got Orpah, we've got Naomi, we've got Ruth here today. No, Naomi didn't make it. Well, I was... I was going to say, and even though Ruth, you're here, we've got a Ruth and Boaz in him. Because <laughs> that was my parents who lived through the book of Ruth. What a testimony for us now. But you know, when we get to heaven, I'm not going to need to read that book. You're not going to need to read that book. We're not going to need what we need now. It's all gone. It's all behind us. And it's forever. Get that word and let that word just, just dwell on that word tonight. Just dwell on that word. I just wanted to clarify. During the Millennium Kingdom, the Lord will also like renew Jerusalem and make it beautiful. Yes. For a thousand yes. years, the earth will also be beautiful, but that same beautiful earth will go away. I believe that, yes, what we have is the new heavens and new earth because that millennium is prior to the great right throne judgment. Oh, yeah. And so when it says, you know, and I believe we're following in order the tribulation, the millennium, great white throne, and it says there, the heavens and the earth passed away. I think because even though he has 
uh, restored this earth to a beautiful degree, it is still an earth that has been tainted. And in fact, let me take you back to what it was originally, because what we have in, in Genesis 1 is really a recreation that God made it suitable for us. I believe, and I'll take you through that when we're in Genesis, that originally this earth was Satan's kingdom. It was the kingdom that he put Satan over. And Satan, the description given in Ezekiel 28, he walked up and down the face of the earth, and it talks about it, didn't call it earth, but he talks about it, and it was until sin was found in him. And then Satan was judged for that sin, for the pride that wanted to raise himself up to be God. And part of his judgment, we know the casting out of heaven where he eventually would be cast out completely. At this point, we know he's fallen from heaven. It's no longer his home. But we do know that at this point, he's still going and accusing us before the Father. There comes the day in, during the tribulation where he can't even do that anymore. But not only was he, did he lose heaven as his home, he also lost his kingdom. I believe that, that God judged his kingdom at that time, and that is what brought the um, what's called chaos over the face of the earth. Because think about it, even just simply, and this is an argument out of silence, there's much more when I take us through the beginning that we will get into, that when God creates, can he create something imperfect? No. no. I don't believe so. So if the heavens and the earth were created in chaos, needed to be fixed up, so to speak, that would attest to God creating imperfectly. That doesn't fit his character. And when we get into the Hebrew, we know that the Hebrew tells us that the earth became without form of void. Not that it was, but it became. That means it wasn't at one point. Something happened. And I'll go through all the scriptures to back it up. It's not the point of the study today, and we're out of time anyway, even if it were the study. But I believe that that, that is what originally was Satan's kingdom, when God recreated it, then he put man in what was God's, I mean, sorry, what was Satan's kingdom. And that's why Satan went after man also. Another reason why, besides the fact he wants all the worship to go to himself, that he also wanted his kingdom back. And in essence, Adam handed him the keys to it. That's why today he is the prince of the pality. Prince, oh boy. Prince Ephesians 6 1. Prince of the, uh, the power of the air. Prince Pallies, the darknesses, the weaknesses in yeah. high places. I can't get it out. 612, thank you. I said 61. 612. Ephesians 612. Thank you, Eric. Keep me on track. Um, because Adam fell from the position God had given him when he ate from the tree that God said no. He failed the test. And we know from Adam and Eve taking the fruit and eating it, death entered in. Well, what did we just talk about? No more death. So I think this earth has to be done away with because it, it has been cursed even, I mean, yes, God could redo it, but it just makes so much more sense that it's fresh, start it's fresh. new, start fresh, start new, and a whole different picture, and we have no idea what. I want to finish verse 4 real quickly. I think that we can do it very quickly. I've got to get back to it in my Bible, um, but we ha I think we've covered well, no more death, and like I said, I think that one hits all of us where we live. There will no longer be mourning. Mourning comes from death. We know that. Mourning is, is crying out also. You've got or crying. Crying is wailing. Crying is the verbal of what the internal is feeling. Um, the silent tears that fall. The crying out comes out from that. And then as it says clearly, the former things or the first things have passed away. What does that mean? Death's passed away. Sorrow's passed away. Crying's passed away. Pain's passed away. That's what he means. He's referring to these things I've just mentioned right here. And this is our eternal scene. Even in the millennium, death still exists. Remember, if they step out of line, their life can be taken from them. You don't think that's going to cause sadness to those who loved them, who were rebelled? Of course it's going to. Even that changes in the new heavens and the new earth in the eternity. No sorrow, no death, no pain, no suffering, no separation. Only dwelling, tabernacling in the presence of our holy God who loves us so much that he went to this degree to intimately have relationship with us. Wow. What 
a note to end on. And I haven't even given you that dazzling description yet. I brought something to show you. You've got to come back next week and see it just to help the mind kind of begin to maybe grasp. But just wait. Do I give a peek or do yes, I make you yes. come back? Yes. Yes. You have to go to the video to see it then. I'll give you I'll give you a uh, Okay, I'll give you a quick glimpse, but I'll give you no explanation today, <laughs> because we'll be here for the next hour during the next class if I do. Uh, this was a model made by someone that I think has pretty good insight. Interesting, isn't it? Doesn't that look like a picture in the mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That big thing? Remember? Oh. Yeah, that's what that is. Yeah. In our chart that we couldn't hang today? Yeah. Yes. And that's notice where it is? It's hovering in the air. Mm -hmm. Now that has it during the millennial time. Yeah, but we're, we're over here. Yeah. We're off our chart. The each corner of that, the furrows at the gate. Somebody studies homework. <laughs> we'll talk about all that. He talked about what these are right here. <laughs> We'll talk about the size, we'll talk about the shape, we'll talk about the colors, we'll talk about the entrances. We will talk so much. It is dazzling, it is delightful, it is indescribable. Well, we get a little description. We don't understand the description, but it is describable because God spent a whole chapter describing it for us, and that's a lot in scripture. You but, mentioned uh, rainbow. Somebody on Facebook, a friend of mine, sent me a picture of a complete <laughs> circle. Yes. Have you seen it? A complete a circle. I did it recently, but I have simple. seen it. Yes. Yes. I've never seen it. The rainbow is complete. It's just from our view on Earth, we cannot see the entire. And it, it makes sense because it is God's, and God's would be complete. And there's a whole lot more. I gave us the lesson on the rainbow ones. Oh, my goodness, is it rich? Because it is. God's gift. It is amazing. It's a dream. I'm going to say the same thing. It looks like a dream. <laughs> right? That's the first thing I thought. That's the first thing I thought. It's a little like the dream. Yeah. 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 It is. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. That happens to be Passover, but I like what it means. It would have been that. <laughs> okay, well, we've got a lot more to cover. We're not here to go through it fast. We're here to bask in the glory of it. But uh, come back next week, and we will talk about its description. I, I don't think there's any chance we won't get there. We've got a little bit to, to get to before we get there. Yeah, we've got just a little bit, but I think we'll at least get into it. I thought we'd move faster, but again, I trust it's been a blessing to you. It has been to me. God's riches, just beyond our amazing. And, and God, again, I, I've been telling him all week my favorite word. In Inevitable, <laughs> beyond description, beyond description. Let me give you a little tease, too. We've got the bride, and we've got the city called the bride. How do you correlate those two? The city's called the bride also. Interesting thought. Work on it. I got an answer for you. Work on it. Okay. Any comments, questions? I did. I did. I think enough. You know, remember, um, I'll, I'll say this since you reminded me. The book that I referred to, especially if you're on video and not able to be in class where we're passing it around, um, and fortunately I don't have copies to be sending out like I used to. I hope to get a reprint one day, but in the meantime, if you go to HCW, stands for Hebrew Christian Witness, which I think. Oh, if you put it up here this way. Okay, that's what HCW stands for. Go to HCWPERL, my last name, dot org, and there is a tab on there for Ruth Pearl, and you click on that tab, you can read her book online. You can also print it out, but it is close to 200 pages, a little over 200 pages. Yeah. I used to know. So, 256 pages. So, you know, just be aware if you print out, you're going to use a ring of paper. <laughs> But uh, it is there for the reading. Um, may it be a blessing to you, to anybody else, like I say, to the video world, which I know I'm looking at that thing because I have to forget it's there. <laughs> Your dad's testimony, too. Oh, dad, my dad's, yes. Yeah. My dad's story is a chapter in the book. Uh, but it's also, if you click on Mike Pro on his tab, you can read his testimony. It's shorter. He, he gave his testimony. My mom gave you part of her autobiography. 
so hers is longer, but it's called From a Hopeless End to an Endless Hope. And I think that's the most ideal title. Am I proud? Am I prejudiced? Yes. <laughs> hey, that's okay. How could I not be? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Okay, let's close in prayer. <sighs> Lord God Almighty, we are full and it is overflowing and we thank you that every cell in our body just scream out praise hallelujah to your holy name we thank you for the promises sure and true that are ours we thank you that you want this intimate relationship with us and lord i don't know why i can't figure out why you love us in our sin even but you do and you draw each one to you and i thank you for my salvation i thank you for each one in this class precious and dear to me that i know has that same relationship with you and i thank you that we feel as if we are your only child that you love us in such a way that we have that intimate relationship lord god we're anxious and we do say even so come quickly lord jesus but let us while we're here work for you and bring somebody else home because you waited just a little longer Thank you for the joy given to me today to step again into my mom's shoes and to share your word. What a privilege, what a joy you have given me, and I thank you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I can quit now or I'll lose. Come. <laughs> Come. Both of us are back. Oh, you want to pick up two CDs if you're getting CDs? The last two classes are both C. Roger. He had to label them here in class today. So, one, so thank and two. Perfect. Yep. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you, Roger. So, Lord bless you all. If the Lord doesn't rapture us, I'll see you next week.